Hey there, thanks for tuning in to Duck Bricks. I'm Chris, and today we are going to be combining every single LEGO Ninjago building set, temples, monasteries, castles, you name it, from 2011 to 2023. That's right, here we can see every single LEGO Ninjago minifigure ever made. You can see Kai, Jay, Zane, all of the villains. You've got Cole, Lloyd, Nia, all of the side characters like the Elemental Masters are there. You've got Wu, Garmadon, and Pixel, as well as all of the random civilians. And from all of these Ninjago minifigures, I've managed to collect a copy of every single LEGO Ninjago set yet, and have been showcasing them in waves on this channel. Like the collection of all the Ninjago mechs video, Dragons or Destiny's Bounty Boats, we've done a little bit of everything, and now it's time for the temples and buildings. So downstairs we have a collection of all of the Ninjago buildings ever made. So the question is, what exactly counts as a building set? Well, if it is any sort of location-based build, whether or not it's a side build to a larger set, or is its own set in its own right, I am going to be including it in this video. There are a couple of notable exceptions, namely the Monastery of Spinjitsu, the original one from 2011. I don't really have that fully built right now because I've actually rebuilt it into a massive scale Monastery of Spinjitsu mock, which you can see up there. It's one of the only system mocks I've ever done, but I used a lot of the pieces in the original 2011 set to make that, so I currently do not have a copy of the set for display. However, I just ordered it on Bricklink, so it should be coming in pretty soon, and I'll be including it halfway through the video, or maybe at, right at the beginning, in case you want to see what that original monastery looks like. I also do not currently have the skeleton bowling set set up, or the kind of spinjitsu training build set up from 2011, both of those because, of course, those pieces went directly into making my big version. So all of those like 2011 early buildings, I don't currently have built. They are coming from Bricklink, so you'll be able to see them in a little bit. But otherwise, everything else, every other Ninjago building is covered in this video. Again, from all the years of 2011 to January of 2023. Now, I figured that this made the most sense to do now because we haven't really gotten a new show for Ninjago yet. We know that later this year, we are getting a brand new TV show that is still some sort of a continuation of the timeline that came before, but I felt like this was a good time to really just combine all of the Ninjago buildings that have come in the past. Here you can see all of them on my shelves here, and I've got a few dedicated shelves for Ninjago buildings. We've got kind of this mid-height one for some of the kind of medium-sized temples and palaces. You've got like the monastery there, the dojo temple, the island, Nia Samurai X Cave Chaos set, all sorts of really great sets there. And then we also have a little section on my shelves dedicated to some of the smaller and shorter buildings, like the blacksmith shop from Hands of Time. You have one of the ice towers from the Forbidden Spinjitsu Ice Castle, all sorts of stuff there. And finally up here, we've got some of the, they're mixed in with Monkey Kid and some other sets, but mostly on the back there, it's all Ninjago stuff, including a canceled Ninjago set. All the way in the back, that set was canceled. So it was really interesting. I did, it, I was able to build it. It was the Monastery of Ice all the way back there in Tan. And then of course we have the very exclusive Lego Christmas employee gift. This was a Temple of Celebration set only given to employees of the Lego group in 2021 to celebrate the 10 year anniversary of Lego Ninjago. And yes, Ninjago is still going strong. There will be countless more buildings. I'm sure that in a matter of months, this video will be outdated because we've seen the leaked set list for this summer sets. We know there's gonna be a lot more temples and buildings, but as of right now, I felt like it was a good time to make this, especially because I feel like this sums up pretty much the story so far before we jump into a brand new TV show. And with that, let's just jump right in to combining all of the Lego Ninjago temples, buildings, castles, palaces, you name it, we've got it, let's go. Okay, so here we have every single Lego Ninjago building. From 2011 to 2023, these are every building that LEGO Ninjago has released as either part of a main build for a set on its own, or even some of the many different side builds that are included in vehicle and ship sets. Every physical location that was an official LEGO set is right here, all assembled together. Now one thing I've tried to do is I've kind of tried to put the quote-unquote hero buildings over on this side, and then slowly transition over to some of the villain buildings on this side, with of course the two Ninjago City mainline sets kind of making up the big center areas, and you've got Ninjago City docks over here as well. And I will say right now, these two sets are probably my favorite LEGO sets ever. It's hard to think of a set that would top them, which is why I feel they really deserve to be the centerpieces of this collection. Now. 
You may notice that there are at least two items missing here. The very first buildings from 2011, the very first dojo training, the early Monastery of Spinjitsu, as well as the skeleton bowling set are not here simply because they are kind of just broken up in my collection and you can see images of them on screen right now. So my apologies, they're not here right now. I have placed Brickling orders for double copies of them, but I've been waiting on them for a while and I figured, you know what? I'm just gonna make the video with everything else because you get the point, you can see what they look like. And these are basically all the other Ninjago buildings. Otherwise, aside from, I guess, maybe a couple poly bags with some like little side builds here and there, this is everything that Ninjago has done from 2011 to 2023 in terms of the actual physical buildings. So there's a lot to cover here, and obviously they aren't really placed in any particular order in terms of years other than just kind of trying to group together the hero stuff and the villain stuff. So what we'll do is we'll actually start over there with the villain stuff because I feel like there's a lot less to cover with those and it's a little bit easier. They're a lot more distinct than a lot of the other Ninjago hero stuff, which does kind of tend to blend together. One thing I tried to do with the lighting was the villain stuff is kind of shrouded in more of the darkness and the hero stuff over there has more light shining down on it. So it kind of shows the difference in the dichotomy between them. And I think it really shows how big the focus is on hero stuff when you can see a lot of the villain temples and buildings really only make up like this section here onwards and then everything else is just dedicated purely towards the heroes. I for one always find it very interesting when Ninjago makes villain buildings because they always look a little bit different and stand out as distinct things from the hero stuff. So let's jump right in. We will start right up front with the very first one. This was Garmadon's Dark Fortress from 2011 Probably one of the most rudimentary Lego buildings out of all of them because, again, this was the very first villain castle set that we got. It looks pretty impressive from the front. You've got the spider that does deploy. Let me see if we can try not to knock anything off here, but you press a button. And that spider sometimes lands on its feet on the ground here. So this is a whole bone spider that kind of detaches on its own. They were featured pretty heavily in the pilot. So you can actually see these creatures crawling around. Unfortunately, without the spider, it looks kind of awkward because you just have a large jumping off point for it. But obviously, the spider is supposed to be kind of the main front point of this. So I think it makes sense to just always kind of have the spider on it. Now... The way this works is you go in and kind of fight your way through the front gate here. This was using a lot of just the standard Lego castle elements of the time. One thing I do like is that it doesn't really feel like a dojo or temple in the Ninjago sense. This feels more like a medieval fortress or the front gate to a big fortress, which I really like because it gave the underworld and the skulk in their own aesthetic. Now, moving on to the back here. There's not a lot to see on the back here. I mean, they've got some like vials and whatnot. And the thing that really stands out to me is that this really does feel like an early 2011 style of Lego original building where Ninjago hadn't really defined its style yet. It didn't really have all the detailed interiors that we've come to expect, but this was kind of pretty much just the bare interior, just a jail for Nia, a bit of a potions or vial section for the Skulk and themselves, and a wanted poster featuring one of the ninja, which is pretty funny, I will say. Now, moving on from this, though, that was the very first one, and I think it makes sense to cover just kind of everything that I've placed around it going forwards. I will try to group this up by factions, though, so any other Skulkin-related building we're going to take a look at now. And the other one is technically, I mean, they're not really Skulkin, but in 2023, we got the Bone Villains for LEGO Ninjago Core. They're kind of their own original villains that are non-canon to the TV show. And they only have like these little things. You've got two little kind of crossbow pieces and two archways. You've got one from the Zane's Ice Dragon set in 2023. And you have a much simpler one from the 4 Plus Lloyd's Ninja Street Bike set, which was a really small $20 set. And that's all you have from the Bone Villains faction, but I do like it how it really does feel like a modern day iteration of what the Skulkins would look like in terms of their buildings, because you've got the same color scheme that they basically used throughout the early waves, as well as Day of the Departed. They really leaned into the red being featured into their color schemes, so I do kind of like how those are a bit of a mashup between these Skulkins and the Ghosts. Moving on back here, again, we're kind of just pretty much trying to go in order of the different sets here. This right here is just a little bit of the Ninjago Season 13 2020 Master of the Mountain buildings. Now, you can see a heck of a lot more of these when we move all the way around here and take a look at the Skull Sorcerer's Dungeon. So this right here is the Skull Sorcerer's Dungeon, if we're going to manage to 
pull this out, and one really unique thing that Ninjago was doing with its buildings in the Master of the Mounted Wave was trying to make them feel like a board game. So what I'll do is I'm gonna try to put it right here to illustrate what exactly that entailed. You can see they have all sorts of individual pieces, which is because everything as part of the Season 13 Wave connected to actually play a full-on board game, kind of like a D&D style board game, where you progress through a certain course and make your way through the levels to battle. So. Here, for example, this was kind of the front entrance to the gate, or you could use this part as the front entrance to the gate here. And everything did connect via a system of clips to each other. So as you can see here, you've got all sorts of different clips, like all of these are clips. You've got clips back here, clips all around, and everything did attach up to allow you to create your own courses and basically make your own tracks. If you wanted to, say, have this part attached to something else, like attach this right here, for instance, that's how you could do it. And that was a really interesting way of making the game a lot more interactive. For instance, you've got a little bit of an exploding trap here. So if you land on the trap, you press a button and the floorboard kind of shoots upwards. One of the coolest things they did with the Skull Sorcerer's Dungeon in particular is this right here. So you may notice that when I twist this, you have these spikes that are swirling on this side, but you also have little bits and pieces of the rock on the front here moving up and down, which is very cool. I mean, you can see this is kind of like sinking into the lava as you move it. And the cage on that side is also rotating upwards as you rotate it. So they basically had Technic axles running through the entire inside of this entire building here to really make everything interactive when you just twisted one thing, which I thought was just super cool. That was such a cool play feature and building that was a blast. You also have another play feature to kind of close up and open up this kind of spiky bone area here. Not really sure what that does or means, didn't really do anything in the show, but you know, that's kind of an aesthetic thing that you can change the look and feel of how this works. And of course, going into here, you have kind of a lava flow to enter the dungeon itself. And if you push this forwards, the lava flow opens and the door itself opens up. So that is just a really cool feature. And all in all, I think this was one of the pinnacles of Ninjago villain set design. It has an absolutely unique aesthetic. It combined with other pieces of the sets like the dungeons area here, as well as just pretty much every single piece was made to combine together into this one massive area. I mean, you've got another section right here that was made to combine. And each one of these is kind of its own game board piece. Like you've got pieces that explode or fall on top of you and all sorts of different little iterations that can be combined I think this is probably the peak of what LEGO has done with Ninjago villain buildings to date. And this came out in 2020, so it's only been a few years since this came out. But this is easily, I think, my favorite Ninjago villain building yet, which is why I wanted to give it so much focus. It just looks so cool, and just look at how good this is in comparison with, say, the Garmanon's Dark Fortress from 2011, which really shows how far LEGO has come in terms of making these playsets. Setting this aside though, I think we can now move our way over to some of the stuff here. Honestly, one of the easiest ways to cover this is probably just by turning everything around and showcasing them on the back here, starting off with this. So this right here is the City of Sticks, and there's a couple other pieces that go with it. Specifically, you've got some ghost pieces which I've put at the front, but I guess I can just bring them all the way back here now to showcase how this worked. So. Essentially what you have is you've got little bits and pieces of the City of Six itself after it's been kind of possessed by the ghosts. So this was an entire area dedicated to the City of Six location from Season 5 Possession, which came out in the summer of 2015. Now, you've got a pretty cool area here where the doors actually open up. You can twist a knob at the back to allow the doors to open up and even allow some vehicles to exit that area. You have an entire build for Ronin's Pawn Shop, which was obviously a very important location in the show itself. And again, one thing I love about the villain buildings, they really do know how to set them apart from other buildings. This has a completely different aesthetic from the other villain stuff we've seen so far as a ghostly coastal city. It's just a really unique design for it. And I like how they're able to integrate some Bionicle and CCBS elements like the Thornax launcher on the top here that kind of acts as a spire that was seen in the TV show itself. And of course, also has the added function of, well, firing the Bionicle style Xamarin sphere like so. 
This is a pretty cool location. It's not one of my favorites. I think it's kind of just okay for what it is in general, but I do like the overall look and feel of this particular city design in and of itself. I think the design in universe and in the show looked really cool. And I think the color scheme of the spring yellowish green and the dark blue definitely did add to the ghostly look and feel of this particular building. I also like how they have the windmill here because, of course, Morrow is the master of wind, so you want to kind of showcase that spinning in the wind and whatnot, which was a very cool addition. And they definitely did try to add a lot kind of, of different courses and areas that could be added onto it. Obviously, nothing nearly as impressive as the Skull Sorcerer's Dungeon here, but for the most part, this was kind of what LEGO was doing back in 2015. On the back side, you have just some trapdoor pieces to allow people to fall into Ronin's pawn shop there. You've got a banner that can be removed, kind of just like a ghostly infected banner there. Not a ton going on in the interior, but certainly a lot more than to be expected here. I like how you do have the knob back here to open up the doors. You've got like slime or ghostly energy or ectoplasm dripping down the sides here. And of course, Ronin is carrying lots and lots of secrets inside his room there, including a special sticker for Klaus's Book of Spells, which canonically by this point in the TV show was burned up and destroyed, but I think it's a nice Easter egg to be able to include an actual sticker piece for that very important spell book in Ronan's pawn shop there itself, just kind of sitting on the table casually. Moving on from this area though, we can take a look at another Lego Ninjago villain set. And this one right here is the Temple of the Crystal King. This was one of the most recent villain bases that came out in 2022, just last year for Ninjago's kind of wrap-up season of Crystallized. This was also a little bit of a Golden Weapons Evil Throne side build from Lloyd's Golden Ultra Dragon, which unfortunately didn't appear in the show. This kind of appeared in the show. I mean, it was the very top of the temple, so I guess that makes sense. And the way that this entire thing works is that the entire build is built around trying to navigate upwards and claim the Golden Weapons for yourself. So... First of all, right here, you kind of have this blade here that can chop upwards if you're trying to claim the Sword of Fire to block you from getting that. You've got all sorts of different kind of collapsing stairs here. So you have a stair piece that collapses on the side there and leaves you to fall. So that's kind of a fun thing to go play around there. But honestly, I'm going to be honest, this is kind of bare bones. I was not the biggest fan of this particular temple. And yeah, this is smaller than a lot of the other temples we've gotten in the past. In fact, the front section isn't even attached. It just kind of sits there and it does look good on display as kind of a facade-esque build. I like how they use the tensegrity building techniques to hold the cage suspended by chains. But for the most part, I think this was honestly a little bit disappointing as the final villain base. I would have expected something a lot bigger but I guess LEGO has kind of decided that villain sets don't really sell that well compared to the Ninja Hero sets, so they decided to kind of give it a little bit less focus, which is a shame, but I do like the aesthetic for what it is. I think the transparent pink crystals do look really good. Cool to get those LEGO Technic beams recolored in transparent pink. That is a really special recolor to get four of those to mimic the temple kind of floating off the ground here. But for the most part, I think this one was just okay. But again, I like how all the villain stuff has its own unique aesthetic, where this looks nothing like any of the other Ninjago buildings we've seen. Now, another building that is somewhat similar to that overall design, but I think pulled it off a little bit better, is the Empire Temple of Madness. Released in the first half of 2020, this was the main villain building for Prime Empire. And there's a couple other Prime Empire things that we can grab around here. You kind of have the front gate to this section here, which just attaches on these macro binocular pieces, a very interesting attachment point there for these particular pieces to be attached. But yeah, that was uh, the attachment point for these. Let me just get that back on here. And this was the Empire Temple of Madness. So I think the coolest thing to me was that they actually had a play feature featuring the Kitanas, which were the collectibles for this wave. If you place the Kitana on the top of the temple and spin it, the entire holographic display opens up and the LEGO designers working on this actually said that was one of the hardest functions to try to work out in terms of making it integrate from the very top going down to all the very bottom there. And I think it just looks really cool when it's done. You've got the game over sign when it's complete revealing what would be the main villain sitting in that chair. So I think overall this was a really cool function and it's just so satisfying to just do one twist and have everything open at once just like that. Now, the entirety of this game was meant to be kind of like playing a platformer game. They were also working with a pretty limited budget for the price and the size of this particular build, so they really just kind of had to make do with what they could. But 
you have a little bit of an area here where the sushi chef could be cooking up some evil sushi right here. So you start with kind of a smaller sushi bit, which is what that's supposed to represent there. And then they grow with this machine into the larger ones where you can see the arrows pointing up, trying to platform your way up to the temple of Unagami. And then you twist this open here. And that reveals one of the evil, like, sushi mouthpieces here to attack you, which was featured in the TV show itself as one of the final bosses as you make your way to Unagami. Moving over to this side, you also just have a bit of a platforming area. One thing I like is the classic retro style arcade cabinet, which is fully built up right here, which is just cool to see in general, this kind of style of arcade build. We had seen that before for stuff like the Ninjago City stuff, but this was a cool thing to see. And overall, that's pretty much all you can see with the interior. It is really just a play focus set, but again, those aesthetics are just so unique. Even when they're still doing a pagoda style temple, it just looks completely and radically different from anything that LEGO has done for their hero stuff. And that's why I love the villain buildings of Ninjago because it gives you different and unique styles. You have these particular curve pieces that are slightly older being used for the arcs of the temple and you have the technology integrated into a Japanese style temple or pagoda type design here, which is really cool and definitely something unique compared to what we've gotten before. And that play feature, oh, that is just so fun. Moving on from this though, we can take a look and this release in the first half of 2020, we can take a look a couple years back to the summer of 2018, where we got, I believe, probably the best Ninjago playset to date at the time this came out in the form of the Dragon Pit. So let me just actually connect up all of the different pieces of the Dragon Pit here because obviously I was saving space by separating them out, but this is the Dragon Pit fully connected. Now, this I feel was one of the last true big style play sets. I mean, this is even bigger than some of the other season 13 stuff. You have a massive function here where twisting one gear allows you to slowly open the gate like it's a really big gate. And one thing I really appreciate is that they really had a lot of attention to detail by having all sorts of different sizes of gears racked and mounted on the wall and making it seem like it was driven by an engine here. So you have kind of an engine that's spinning up to actuate the gears of the actual door opening. Obviously all of this is for show, but it works really well because it's just so satisfying to just slowly open that gate and of course release the dragon, which also came in the set, which is now hanging from the ceiling like all of my other Lego Ninjago dragons. Specifically, it came with the Earth Dragon, which was a cool inclusion to get because it had a pretty unique color scheme. Now, Looking just at the overall piece itself, one other cool thing here is that they also had an escape feature, so twisting a gear at the back of the model here allowed a trapdoor in the jail cell to swing open and the ninja to escape from this particular area, or maybe that was just feeding them into the pit itself. Maybe that's less of an escape and more of just feeding them to the dragons, which was a really cool design here. You can have that just swing open, and I like how it's congruent with the trapdoor opening as well. They kind of happen at the same time, having your minifigure slide into the pit, which is just a cool function to have. And then over here, you've got some carvings of the dragon, which were featured in the show itself, and you even have a chain bola type launcher, where this is a dual launcher, so if you wanted to kind of attack some dragons here. You can just press this button and it would shoot both of these at once where you have a missile that's intended to kind of sling around a dragon's neck. And if you actually have good aim, this can go around the neck of a dragon that you're flying around nearby. So that was a really cool dragon hunting feature. Unfortunately, around the back, there wasn't a ton of interior space. You had a little bit of a forging area with the anvil here, which I guess makes sense. I mean, you definitely want to have some sort of interior space for the dragon forging, and that was featured in the show itself. But for the most part, I mean, a lot of this is admittedly empty space. It's just to store the dragon and have the gates open, but I think it was worth it because you have so much fun stuff to play around with with this set just right on the outset. And this was one of my favorite Ninjago villain sets, I think. Looking at them, this was probably my favorite one until the Season 13 Master of the Mountain set came along. But with that, we can now move on to the next build. Again, my apologies that everything is kind of out of order here because I'm really just trying to focus on each one one at a time. So I'm just going to put this away for now so we can just clear up some room here and take a look at our next build. So this right here was Garmadon's Volcano Fortress from the Lego Ninjago movie. 
I'm gonna be honest, I think this is probably one of the weakest Ninjago movie sets. It's not bad by any means, but given that the Ninjago movie sets were absolutely a leg above everything else that had come before, and were super, super unique and had some of the coolest building techniques, this just felt all right. I mean, this kind of felt like an average villain base that you would see from like Ultra Agents or something like that, which isn't bad, but I definitely was expecting something just a little bit more interesting for the main villain base for the Ninjago movie, especially given how amazing the other Ninjago movie buildings were. Still, that being said, it was cool that we actually got a model of the Garmadon base itself. It has a little fish tank in the back. I think that's my favorite feature. You can actually see some fish swimming around in the tank at the back there. So that was pretty cool to see. And there was even a volcano launching feature where there is this massive gear on the side here. And all that does really is, let's say you've got like Zane or a minifigure trapped here. All it does was to launch him from the top like the volcano erupted super basic feature but i like it i mean that's a pretty simple thing to have and overall this is just a really bare bones style of base i mean you've got one type of thing here that just opens up but it's not that interesting i mean it's just like a castle wall that opens up and this came out in 2017 around the final waves of the lego ninjago movie and yeah it was okay i think my favorite detail here is just the mini piranha mech that's probably my favorite thing about it is just seeing that little micro build of the piranha mech just cool to see that actually being reflected in the set itself from there though we can move on from garmadon's volcano lair and take a look at the next build so next up here we have let's see what do we want to get well let's get some of the rise of the snake stuff we'll get these out of the way these were just some of the small side buildings for the Ninjago Rise of the Snake sub-theme in 2012. I'm actually going to sneak around over here and get some of our other snake-oriented builds because there were a couple more, not a ton more, but I mean, you've got this Fangpire staff holder from Jay's Stormfighter, and you actually have this one, which was from Ninjago Legacy in 2021, so... That was a callback to some of these early designs that came in one of the epic battle sets. But everything here was released in 2012, and this was the biggest building that was essentially meant to represent the top tower in the city of Ouroboros. Again, Ninjago was still trying to kind of figure out its identity and what villain buildings would look like, so this was just okay, I think. I mean, it definitely is super, super basic, but it was basically just a jail cell, which can be opened up. The ninja can be stored inside there. And of course, you do have these snake heads dripping the venom down, which was a feature replicated in the TV show itself. I think my favorite thing is just how it looks like aesthetically in terms of having this massive tower with the sticker kind of continuing alongside the pieces here to showcase the venom dripping down for the city of Ouroboros to summon the Great Devourer. You've got the snake pieces curved in gold here, these specially molded snake pieces, which kind of curve around this fountain here that's shooting out some venom. And again, this was just a side build for the Ultra Dragon, so nothing super crazy going on, but still interesting. Lastly, we also had a little bit of a build here for the Shrine, and this was a very basic thing. How this worked is that you had these pieces that were tilted upwards, and then you could place the snakes in, tilt them downwards, and the snakes would slither out like that and kind of launch them. So what you do here is you put a snake right here, and you press down and... Boom, snake launches at you. So you can pretend they kind of slither out of the wall here, park right here, and then just attack you like that. That's a cool function for just a little set. This was one of the only sets to feature kind of the Zane ZX figure back in 2012, just stealing a staff. That was pretty much all that was included. I think it just does its job for being a small side build. And this is also just another throwaway side build for the Fangpire staff. This one also had the Venomari staff on it, I think. It just attaches like that. So you have to battle the snakes first. And then you could have claimed the staff, but this one was for the Fangpire staff, and that was how these little miniature sets worked. Moving on from these, though, let's now take a look at some of the other stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and also put these away for now to clear up some of our space on our counter here. And we already took a look at the Bone Villain stuff, so we'll, we'll get that settled away as well. There were not a lot of buildings for the Ninjago and Ninjroids kind of faction, but we've got just a couple here. Let me see if there's anything else. And these were all from Ninjago Legacy. This was a little bit of a blaster tripod that came out in 2020 with Kai's fighter jet for Legacy. And these were just little Ninjroid assembly plants that came out in the epic battle set with the Ninjroid versus Zane. I think my favorite one is this one because you can actually mimic the Ninjroid being assembled in the factory like that puts his head on like so. I really do like that feature and maybe you could pretend like first if you just want to detach everything else, you could say you have 
just the legs here and then this whole thing comes in from the factory and it's just the torso so you kind of line that up and then position the torso there now that that's settled this goes up again and then you just have the head left so you attach the head onto here and there you have it a fully built ninjroid so for just being a throwaway build and a ten dollar set i like it i think it gets the job done so only builds that we got for the Ninjroid faction were these. We didn't even get any physical builds for the actual rebooted wave in 2014, but I think they're okay, and again, it does feature that color scheme for the Ninjroids. Moving on from that, though, we have a pretty cool build from 2018, actually. This was the Temple of Resurrection, and this was, I mean, I guess it was kind of a hero building or a vi vi villain building, depending on the way you want to look at it, but obviously this was used by the villains, and it does have a very villainous aesthetic transformation feature, which is quite interesting to see. So first of all, this is kind of just a standard temple. It was meant to be featured as part of the Ninjago kind of Emperor and Empress Temple, However, when Garmadon is resurrected, what you do is, well, first of all, you just have these standard just weapons being shown. So no nothing sinister going on here. I guess ignore that one Oni mask. But you reveal the Oni masks by rotating these pieces around like so. And then you pull a lever at the back, which causes the entire temple to collapse. And then you can see it. This is like an evil face. So you've got two evil eyes and like a mouth here. That is a really interesting transformation feature for a temple. I did not see that coming. I mean, I don't know. This was one of the most creative things that they put out for Ninjago because you've got that really cool transformation feature. And it just easily resets by just pushing the lever down again. There we go. It's just a sander temple with maybe a cave at the bottom. And you just turn it into the evil form like this that was just super fun to be able to play around with and kind of have people go into the maw of the cave itself now resetting everything here there was a little bit of an interior to the temple of resurrection not a huge one i mean you have some sorts of different things symbolizing the return of garmadon like some special stickers there and all the oni masks forming his return i kind of find it interesting how they don't seem to have the finalized version of garmadon being used here they're still using the iteration from the stone warriors epic battle stuff so maybe they just weren't sure what final version they were using when they were making the decals but yeah pretty much that was the temple of resurrection i also like how when it's in the villain mode you have like flames shooting out of the top as well it's a really interesting way to transform a temple and a really easy one to do you just kind of flip a lever and that transforms kind of from what seems to be a nice and good guy looking temple to something a lot more sinister this is definitely one of the most traditional ninjago buildings that we got for the villains but i think that given how it has a transformation feature and is just a lot more sinister when you look at it a little bit closer that definitely does take the cake as one of the most interesting ninjago buildings they did over this time and of course there is a trap door as well so these two things do fall in, so you can fall and have many figures fall through the trapdoors as well. Just realize that as well. Moving on from this, though, let me go ahead and set this down here. We can take a look at our next build. And coming in next is this build right here from The Island. Now, The Island was just a special that released in 2021. It was during the March wave of releases after Ninjago Legacy. And this is actually one of my favorite villain buildings, despite it being pretty small. So obviously this doesn't really look anything like how it appeared in the TV show. It kind of just does its own thing. But you have a massive statue of lava of Wojira sticking out of the side there. I think you have one of the most iconic parts of the island itself, which was the totem statues, which come to life and kind of act as characters on their own and act as enemies of their own. They kind of bounce around and they can separate out. So each of these is its own individual foe to battle, which I thought was a very cool feature to have for this particular style of villain type set. So you've got, oh, let's set that back up here. And overall, the island itself was basically set up so that you could have some play features kind of going into it. One thing that you have here is that you were supposed to have, say, this piece attached down to the bottom. So if you were to take a step onto the way this is supposed to set up is you take a step onto the chain here and that eventually causes this to whip upwards and cause you to hang and dangle from the chain itself. You have a stud shooter, like you press down on the pressure plate, and the stud shooter actually launches multiple studs at you, so that was a cool thing to see there, these lightning-based studs. And everything was built around having these deadly traps around the island itself, which was a very unique setting for Ninjago, and is honestly really reminiscent of the LEGO Pirate Islander sets, which came out 
earlier, back kind of all the way back when early Pirates was coming out, especially some of the very classic King Kahuka style Islander stuff like this one right here, or even the Islanders Fortress in this particular area here. I just really like how it kind of felt like a callback to some of those early Pirate lines, which were some of my favorite to collect for the vintage era. Now, moving on to the back, there's not a lot to see here. I mean, you can see they, they've got a stew going back there, so you've got some ingredients to make a stew. You have a bit of a jail area behind the Wojira's mouth feature here, but super simple. I mean, this is the most basic of jail areas, but most of the play is just being able to look at this really good looking build for an island. I just wish we got bigger buildings for the island because if this was this good being, I believe this was only like $40 or something really cheap, I can only imagine what they could have done with the concept at a much higher price point. But overall, a very good small-scale Ninjago building, and I think definitely one of the most interesting small-scale buildings they've done in a long time. With that, though, let's now move this aside, and that does all separate out, so I have to be a little bit careful with this building here. Let's now take a look at what we have coming up next. So one of the most basic buildings that is also a villain building came out in 2018, this was just Harumi's throne room, and this does not resemble anything of what it appeared like in the show itself. I guess the designers were thinking that this is maybe inside the Temple of Resurrection or the Emperor and Empress's Temple of Ninjago, but obviously the throne wasn't for Harumi, it was for Garmadon, and the throne itself was like on the top of the wreckage of Borg Tower, so this looks nothing like how it looked like in the show, but it's an okay little set. I mean, it's just super, super basic. I'm honestly not the biggest fan of these really basic Ninjago build designs, they feel just more like facades to me, but for a really cheap price point and basically acting as a minifigure pack with a ton of exclusive and desirable minifigures like Skylar and Pixel and Lloyd as well, this was just a good little figure pack to get. From here, we can now move on to some of our next buildings and something a little bit more interesting, where this was the Ice Emperor's Temple of 2019, or the Ice Emperor's Castle. It also came with bit of a crossbow area here which was just kind of off to the side there. So the Ice Emperor's Castle was the summer 2019 main building and this did have a whole feature to itself where you could put a Ninjago spinner here like one of these spinner pieces and have this entire thing open up and act like you're using Spinjitsu to get closer to the Ice Emperor but getting frozen in the process which was a very very cool concept for a Lego build. Honestly, though, I definitely wanted something a lot bigger for the castle of the Forsaken Emperor. It was such a big and impressive castle in the TV show itself that I really did wish that they were able to do more with the design. Most of the budget for this particular set went into Boreal the Ice Dragon, which is again hanging from the ceiling, which you can see... Right up there was the Ice Dragon Boreal, who was featured in the set itself. But otherwise, the building was kind of lackluster because most of it was just focused on the big dragon. I think it's okay for a Ninjago building, but it definitely could have been a lot more interesting. You have a jail cell here of frozen ice, which can be opened up using a clear windscreen piece, which was an interesting choice to have that being built out of ice itself. And you actually have a bolt launcher here for the spring-loaded missiles done in brown which was a pretty cool color to get because we don't often get these in brown. So that was a very nice inclusion for this particular villain set. Overall though, I like the aesthetics of the ice samurai and the ice villains, but I definitely wish we got more. And I saw prototype images of the set, which looked a lot bigger and more interesting. And I just wish that we got those instead, because while I do like this and think it's okay for what it is, I definitely wish that we got something just a little bit bigger for the Ice Emperor himself, which I think is probably the best Ninjago minifigure we have ever gotten. With that though, let's now move on to the next build. Now this here is quite the oddity, because folks watching this may not recognize this as an actual Lego Ninjago set. And you are right, this is not a Ninjago set. This was a cancelled Ninjago set, which made it very, very, very close into production until they changed the storyline of the TV show last minute, and it no longer made sense to fit in the story. So this is the Monastery of Ice. It was meant to be one of the sets for the 2019 Summer Wave, Secrets of the Forbidden Spinjitsu, and for whatever reason, it was cut. It was supposed to feature the crag, um, kind of the main crag character, who was supposed to be a small, like, elderly little creature, as opposed to a character who was just a big yeti. But of course, after they changed the storyline and made the mentor Sorla instead of crag, they no longer needed this monastery where he lived in. 
What's really interesting to me is that you have some physical representations of all of the elements featured here. So you have the element of water, green, fire, ice, earth, and lightning there. I have no idea what that was supposed to be about, but I mean, presumably that was supposed to factor into the storyline of season 11. Obviously that never came to be. Down here you have a potions making area, which is what that looks like, and some scrolls that are sticking out of the box. So really interesting to see. I have no idea what the deal was, was supposed to be with all of these different builds here. And then going all the way up to the top, you've actually got some other T area features, kind of more of like a calm area, a catapult to launch little projectiles. You have a sextant or a compass looking outwards, and presumably all of these would have had stickers, but again, this was a prototype model that was reverse engineered by Sakoda, who you may know for building the Legend of the Bionicle set. Now, there is a little bit of a feature here where these stairs do collapse when you pull out this piece here. Not a super interesting one, but I mean, it's, it's just an all right basic feature. And I did a full review on this recently, so I will just move on from this now. But yeah, I wanted to rebuild it because it's one of the only clear images of just a very obvious like prototype Ninjago model featuring a cancelled part of the storyline that we've never gotten before, which I just find really interesting and wanted to have in my collection. Thankfully, the design of this building was actually recently reused in Tommy Anderson, creator of Ninjago's kind of semi-canon, could-be-canon, Splinter in the Blind Man's Eye storyline, which he is publishing as a web serial on Twitter. So this kind of lives on in sort of Ninjago canon, even though it was a cancelled set. So I do like how he managed to factor that in there as one of the temples on the Wailing Alps. Moving on though, I think that we can just set this aside. Let's move into some of the last villain buildings. So the first one that we have here is the Ninjago movie Garmadon's Temple. Oops, it looks like a piece must have fallen off here when we are moving stuff around. I do not know where this goes, so I will set this blue bar aside, because that looks pretty important. Maybe it's from the bottom or something. But we have this temple here, and this was part of the LEGO Ninjago movie lineup. And this was basically the Garmadon family home, so this was where Lord Garmadon... Oh, so where Lord Garmadon... Everything's fallen off this thing here. Lord Garmadon used to live here in this house, and it was a lot larger and more impressive in the LEGO Ninjago movie itself, but here it is, just kind of a basic temple. One of the scrapped ideas from the LEGO Ninjago movie was that it was guarded by these kind of traditional Chinese or Japanese lion guardians, and they were supposed to come to life and attack the ninja. That never happened in the movie itself, so right now they're just kind of stat statues that are decorative, and yeah, they were statues in the movie as well, so that's just kind of a remnant of one of the cancelled plot lines of the movie itself. But setting aside these just identical builds here, this is the main temple, and most of it is just a facade. I mean, you have the door opening here, so you can kind of have the door open up like so, if we can kind of get this to squeeze open. Wow, those joints are very, very tight. I don't know if anything's... No, nothing's, nothing's preventing it from opening, but yeah, there we go. That was the, the door right there, so the door just swings open and you can get access to the interior itself. This went through a lot of design iterations, and I recently put out, or somewhat recently, put out a video on the making of the Ninjago movie that showed a ton of prototypes for this model. I think this is probably one of the best they landed up with, especially given the interesting color scheme and design for the model itself, but it's just interesting how much effort went into designing the look and feel of this particular temple, which does look really good from the outside. I mean, this just looks really cool looking as a whole temple from the outside itself. And moving on to the back here, you've got a couple of things like traps, like swords that swing down from the walls. You have a TNT block that swings down and just falls on your head, so that's an interesting play feature to feature there and you have a boulder that does drop from the ceiling like so a very sudden drop and then you just roll it back up here overall though i think this was just a little bit too shallow for me i definitely would have liked it if it was just a little bit deeper had a little bit more interior space but then you even have a temple that or a kind of hidden chest that goes out of the back here that allows the trap door to also fall when you remove it from this particular area and inside this hidden treasure chest were supposed to be representations of different elements. So you've got like the different gold pieces there for gold. And originally they had the different elements featured there as well. 
Honestly though, this is just pretty basic. I like the reference to the Vermilion here. That was kind of just a callback to the previous season of the TV show, The Hands of Time Season, where they were reusing some of the Vermilion armor and the snakes to factor in here. But overall, I think the outside of this temple looks a lot better than the inside, for sure. I mean, this was definitely one of the best looking exteriors to a temple yet for Ninjago. I mean, this looks really good. I love the very iconic red doors. These are really, really kind of big doors that just close up here and you've got the tall vertical columns but then everything else is just pretty basic on the inside with that though let's now move on onto some of the items here and we can now kind of switch places and showcase some of the stuff in the front so on the front here, we've got a couple more builds from the 2019 Ice kind of Never Round build. This was just a small build featuring Lloyd and Nikita for Lloyd's Journey. And I guess the intent with this was to get like four copies of it and build an entire stronghold fortress that they all connect to each other for different walls of the Ice Empress Castle. But it's just a super solid, simple build there. I like the color scheme of the Ice villains. This right here is Tiger Widow Island from the Skybound lineup in the January 2016 wave. And essentially this was supposed to represent the Tiger Widow Spider, which was a lot bigger in the show, but I guess that's what they could do with the parts they had. And I also like how this feels like a callback to Lego Islanders. If you look at the color scheme of the flags there, this feels like an early version of what they wanted the island to be, which obviously they did a lot better in the island itself, but I think this was an interesting build overall. One thing that I do find is cool about the play feature here is that you actually have a whole feature that allows the mouth to open, so if you get the foliage out of the way, you just twist a lever back here and a chain just opens up the mouth here to allow you access to the Tiger Widow's Cave, so interesting to see that feature being included. But overall, it's just a basic build. I do like the stickers in the back kind of talking about how to seize the Sword of Souls and then get the poison and use it to poison the gin there. So overall, just an interesting thing. Map of Ninjago Island as well, which is quite cool to see. But yeah, just a really basic piece here. I think the most interesting thing is using the Power Miner's drill piece as the underside of a rock formation. That is a definitely, that's a cool piece usage there. From there, we have another Skybound build, but this actually did not come out with the mainline Skybound sets. This instead was in the Summer 2016 Day of the Departed sets, which also had Skybound Wave 2. And this was just a little side build featured alongside Lloyd's Energy Dragon for a little outpost for the Sky Pirates. Nothing too crazy going on here, so we can move on and take a look at some other stuff. Here is a little shrine dedicated to the Dragon Armor from the 2019 Summer Wave that goes just right alongside the Dragon Pit. And over here, we have an entire building sort of setup dedicated to an arena for the Sons of Garmadon January 2018 wave. So this came with one of the spinners, specifically Lloyd's spinner for the Sons of Garmadon wave. And the entire point of the set was that this acts as a battle arena for the spinner. You kind of let the spinner loose, it spins around here, and you use these as the villains to try to stop him. So you've got like a razor saw to knock him over and some tires with minifigures mounted on it to spin around. You have these hammers that rotate around when the spinner hits it. And you even have a door that once you bust through the door itself, that causes different kind of pieces to fall here. It is locked on the back. So overall, just a pretty interesting set for a spinner arena. We had gotten a few other spinner arenas before. I definitely, now I'm remembering that there's another Ninjago sort of building that's missing that was a spinner arena back in 2012. Ooh, I can see it buried there. I'll show a picture of it because I'm not taking that out right now. But Ninjago has been doing spinner arenas like this, some simpler than others, but they have been doing it around the 2011, 2012 area. And they very occasionally did them when they were still doing gimmick sets. And this was pretty much the latest one that we ever got for a spinner style arena in 2018. Cool to get the underground Sons of Garmadon hide up, but I think the aesthetics are just kind of basic compared to what we would see for the other villain stuff. And finally, we can move on here and take a look at just another little build, which is the Stone Armor Outpost. This was not part of the Stone Army from 2013. Instead, this was part of Day of the Departed in 2016. Just a very basic side build for the Rock Rotor. Also, here are just some other side builds for the Serpentine, like a launcher that came with the new version of the Legacy Ultra Dragon. So cool to see that, but just super basic Serpentine stuff. I like the Ouroboros-like sticker design on that, though. 
Also for Ninjago Legacy, we have a ghost build for the epic battle sets. And back in 2015, we got some actual builds for the ghosts themselves, although these are very, very, very basic. Moving on from that, Ninjago Legacy in 2020 also gave us this 4 plus City of Sticks. So this was kind of just the 4 plus representation of the ghostly City of Sticks that we previously saw before. Also on the 4 plus line, we got a little bit of a build for Zane's boat from the Sons of Garmadon Wave in 2018. I like how they have the printed Royal Family of Ninjago symbol on this particular building. From here, just breezing through these little builds, this was part of the LEGO Prime Empire 2020 wave, and that was the January 2020 wave for Season 12, and this was a figure pack for the Prime Empire market where you could buy items, weapons, or enter the main boss fight for Prime Empire itself. And alongside it, you have these little builds representing the Kitana holders for just kind of little loot boxes that you could find here. Moving onwards... I think we are on the final two villain buildings. The first one here is a set of buildings that were dedicated around the Tournament of Elements wave. In January of 2015, we got all of these builds except for this one, which was in 2021 January for Ninjago Legacy, which was just a little prison that opens up if you shoot it just right with the Cole's Boulder Blaster set. And the other Zane's Dragon for the Titanium Dragon was this build right here, so you can see how this one worked. You could launch bolas at the dragon itself, and this was just another gate for one of the other sets. The main building for Tournament of Elements, though, was this. Enter the Serpent was part of an original idea for Tournament of Elements that made it all the way into these sets that showcased them trying to kind of bring back or resurrect this massive anachondri serpent where it was built into the temple itself. That's why it was called Enter the Serpent, because when you entered the temple, you were literally entering the serpent's mouth. And that's why it has all these different features like the purple serpentine kind of curves around the side there. You have the entire serpentine head which comes to life at the top and can be articulated. And that never happened in the TV show. Klaus did have a big anachondri serpent, but it was never really explained what it was or why it was so big. He just kind of had one. And this was just a pretty basic build. I like how it feels very different compared to other Ninjago stuff. Feels more like an adventurous temple or something you would see in the jungle. But overall, this was just a pretty basic build for 2015. And from there, We'll take a look now at some of our final builds for the villains. I'm going to just move them onto the side here. All of these different modules here are part of the Seabound Temple for the Merlopians, the Temple of the Endless Sea. And the way that this worked was that, oh, you've also got a little bit of an anachondrite launcher here as well was that all of these different modules work together kind of similar to the Master of the Mountain stuff, but honestly just not that impressive in the way that they all connect, but you connect up all these modules and this was the temple wojira the sea serpent sat right here you can see wojira over here which i have mounted to the wall as kind of a villain representation here so i do have the main wojira kind of sea serpent here and that was basically chained to the temple of the endless sea so i have wojira here but otherwise the main temple itself was pretty standard this was just a side build that came with the water dragon so that was just kind of in the same aesthetic but I actually really like the aesthetics of this. I mean, the teal looks really good, and I like how this does feel like an underwater temple. It has a very unique look and feel and aesthetic vibe to it. You have a crossbow launching outwards here. You have a bit of a prison area, and there was also a clam area that opened up. I don't see it here. It must be around, I mean, it must be around here somewhere, but there was a clam with a pearl in the mouth that opened up. Honestly, I must have put it We'll get to it when we get to it. It's somewhere around this area, but overall the Temple of the Endless League did have a good aesthetic. It was just another villain uh, building that I did feel could have benefited from a larger set. I really do wish that we got a bigger building for them because this is a really cool aesthetic and vibe to it. And I really do like how everything came together. Overall, rotating on the back there, not a ton of interior detail. Like you've got some scrolls and you've got a disc launcher and some gold, but honestly, the big main part of it is just being able to take a look at the main building on the front here and kind of just acting as a facade, but one that does look pretty good. Lastly, we have this, which is like a little ramshackle structure for the Vermilion. I was never the biggest fan of the aesthetics of the Vermilion buildings just being in the swamp, so this was like one of the buildings that you could find in the swamp itself. You've got a little piece here that kind of causes the 
vermilion egg to knock over and spill these snakes outwards for the hands of time. You also had these particular elements here. This was part of one of the side builds for just one of the small battle sets that did connect. I did like how they connected, so they made it kind of modular in the way these buildings worked. But for the most part, you only had two different modules, so there weren't really that many pieces that you could even connect to each other. And this was probably just one of the most basic ramshackle buildings for the swamp itself. I found the clam. It was the clam for the Merlopian Temple of the Endless Sea there with a pearl inside. That was just the Mysterio piece. So I do like how they managed to factor that in as a little small side build that does connect onto the main sides here. But finally, we have after all that, summed up every single one of the villain buildings. They're not all here because I put a lot of them down, but most of the villain buildings you can see right here. And that was, that was a lot to cover. But now it's time to move on to the hero buildings and there are even more hero buildings than villain ones, but I think it'll take a little bit less time because I suspect that because the hero buildings tend to blend in a lot together, a lot of them are just these little small dojos, we should be fairly faster on these. This was the Ninjago Legacy Monastery of Spinjitsu released in 2019. It was part of the first wave of Ninjago Legacy sets and is one of my favorite Ninjago buildings ever that isn't one of the Ninjago City sets because this is the perfect representation of the Monastery of Spinjitsu from the TV show. I love the location so much that before this came out, literally in the summer of 2018, I actually built a mock of kind of a TV show scale version of the monastery itself. You can see it up there. That was just kind of one of my custom mocks. And then literally like a few days after I built it, the new leaks came out that this was coming out as a Lego set. So that was kind of funny how I was like, oh, I didn't need to do that because they're going to make a better one as part of the Lego set anyway. But it was just really cool to be able to put this together and see it as an actual Lego set accurate to the TV show itself. Now, of course, you have the main doors that swing open like so, and there was a lot of training equipment featured inside, I think. This was part of the training equipment that went on the inside here. It kind of just clips on to some of the inside parts. And I like how they did their own representations of the legacy murals here, where you have a bit of an image denoting all of the major events. So you have the preeminent from the possession season. You have Nauticon the Jinn from Skybound, the Iron Doom from Hands of Time. You have Firstborn from the 2019 hunted season, one of the Oni masks from the Sons of Garmadon season, the Ninja handprint symbol from the March of the Oni season. You have Master Chen from Tournament of Elements, Python from Rise of the Snakes and some of the other snakes like the Vermilion and whatnot back there. Then, of course, you have the Overlord and Zane Sacrifice being really featured there. And then the early seasons, like the Golden Dragon, Garmadon with all four golden weapons facing off against the Great Devourer there. And then the Tornado of Creation representing the very first pilot season. Pretty much all the different major events of Lego Ninjago's history are featured here, aside from Day of the Departed, because no one cares about that. Moving on from that, though, we can take a look at the inside of the main temple itself. And this was just a really nice building to get. Of course, you have Master Wu's tea shop there. You have a whole area that is dedicated to training. So you have these swords that spin around and do actually rotate to reveal some special hidden features there. So the tree there rotates around to reveal the sword. And then here, this is a cool thing. You have the golden weapons on display, but if you push this, you could actually launch a minifigure from the back there and cause these two sides to split open. This is surprisingly a very playable set. There is basically no interior whatsoever. I mean, it is all just a facade. I guess this is an interior, but not really. I mean, that's just a little holding space for the most part. This was just a big facade, but for once I didn't mind it because obviously with the Monastery of Spinjitsu, you want the focus to be on playing and doing training in the courtyard and being able to pose the ninja inside the monastery itself. So this was easily one of the best ones they did for Ninjago Legacy and definitely one of the ones that really was needing to be made. And here's that original Monastery of Spinjitsu. This was the original version from 2011 and pretty much the first main building focus set we got for the first half of the year in 2011. This obviously is a lot more rudimentary than what we got for Legacy. You do have some mostly play feature centered functions here like the rotating swords and you've got chopping blades on this side. But for the most part, this feels like more of a dojo training type thing than the monastery itself with really the only similarity being the front gate. Although I do like these stickers being used here. 
you. Those are good designs. Overall, though, this is really rudimentary. There's a reason why I didn't really bother to keep my own copy assembled. I just bought the second copy off of Bricklink because my parts aren't sorted and there is not a chance I'm going to be able to find all the pieces to remake this. But in case you're curious, this is exactly what it looked like. Moving on, we have a lot of smaller side builds from the Epic Battle line. So you've got like Epic Battle side builds here, which I guess kind of fits in with the rest of the monastery stuff. You have a new dojo training area. This is actually from the Ninjago 2023 Ninja Brick Box. So that's one of the side builds that you can build from the brick box itself. Very reminiscent of the original training arena in the dojo. So I like kind of putting those together. This was the Master Wu Falls set from the Lego Ninjago movie in 2017 featuring the bridge where Wu could battle against Garmadon, that's why these studs are there, and it was basically just a little scene to have two minifigures fight each other with one of the ninja in the cage there, which was cool. I mean, I like using the tread pieces from LEGO Technic as a suspended rope bridge, and overall, this was just a really cool design, and it just looks really good in general for the bridge itself. Moving on from the 2017 Master Falls set, it's time to take a look at the 2013 Temple of Light. And yeah, this is not one of my favorite temples. It's very, very, very basic for what it is. This came packaged with the golden mech, which literally just stood in the temple itself. So I think it makes total sense. I use it in a winter village scene, which is why there's a lot of fake snow on it right now. But this was basically the most rudimentary temple that they were doing back in 2013. Obviously, Ninjago has come a long way. Just look at the difference from this to that. And obviously, there are different price points and trying to accomplish different things. But I think it's really cool to see how much LEGO has changed and evolved from going from very basic buildings that are very blocky and square like this to something that looks just so much more interesting in the modern era. Still, this did bring a very unique aesthetic to the table with having these large dome pieces being used as kind of the icons of the Temple of Light itself. And despite the building itself not being the most interesting set, it was a very important location in the Ninjago TV show and even the Dark Island comic trilogy, so definitely one that deserved a set of its own. Moving on from the Temple of Light, we can take a look at the next set here. I mean, actually, well, let's take a look at the entrance way here. This is kind of the entrance I set up with the ninja in their core suits and their standard hair. This is actually from the Legoland Ninjago ride set. I guess it's not technically a Ninjago set, but I felt like it made pretty much perfect sense to fit in here. That's why it has the Lego logo and the Ninjago logo there. That was the rest of the buildings you can find right here. And it was basically simulating the Ninjago Rai that you can find at pretty much every or almost every single Legoland park out there, where you use the different elements to kind of blast forwards and shoot elements at the villains. It had a little screen where you could fight the villains itself. So like there's a little picture of Scales and Slithera there, which was a very cool inclusion. This came out around, I believe, 2020. So pretty interesting to see just that original graphic style for the villains being used there. And then just a standard pagoda for the line queue otherwise. And... Yeah, it's just a really basic little ride piece here, but I thought it was cool to include this with the rest of the Ninjago buildings, especially that archway, because it literally has the Lego and the Ninjago logos, just like you can see in the parks themselves. Right behind it, we have one of my favorite Ninjago legacy sets, more because of the figures it includes rather than the building itself, but this was the Tournament of Elements set. This was a remake of the Dojo Showdown in 2015, and you can see a lot has improved from 2015 going over to 2021. And this was one of the original sets to include Elemental Masters. Most of the other Tournament of Element sets didn't actually include any of the other Elemental Masters, which was very weird. But this one included Karloff and Griffin Turner. And this one included Gravis and Belobo, and as well as Jacob Hefsner. So this one included three of the missing ones we were waiting for. And... The Jade Blade mold has long been destroyed, so they recolored the weapons pack from the Hunted line in green, which I think works out fine for the Jade Blades, at least for the little ones there. One thing I really like is that it was an Easter egg to the show itself that one of these vases is hiding a Jade Blade, not that one. This one. So in the show itself, one of the vases, you have to shatter it to find the Jade Blade. So you just stick one in there and you have to figure out which one has it. So that was a cool callback. This did include another version of Klaus's Book of Spells, which I currently have being held by the minifig itself. And yeah, while this is a really simple standard pagoda build, for $30, having so many different minifigures in it, this was definitely one of my favorite sets. And I've seen a lot of folks online who've actually combined multiple copies of this set to form a full circular arena, just like how it appeared in the TV show. So that's a really cool thing that you can do if you want to get multiple copies. 
Moving on from these though, I mean, this was just a really basic battle arena type setup. Super blocky, super basic, but I do kind of like how it has a simple charm to it, like jumping up the platforms here, having poison missiles launch at you and so on. It's a good looking set in general. From there, we have another very basic, just kind of curved set here, and you'll notice a lot of them follow the same template, and they do start to look very similar, where you've got this whole Cryptarium prison setup, which was for the second wave of Skybound in the summer of 2016. This entire gate does open up, and you can lift this up to hold it open, and then you can close it like that. Really basic, this is kind of just another copy or very similar copy of the Harumi's Throne Room set. A lot of them just follow this very same exact aesthetic for the visual design. It's just okay, getting a full-on Cryptarium prison that was actually a big Supermax jail type thing would have been a lot more interesting though, but I understand they just wanted to do it for a smaller set. It's weird that we actually got Cryptarium prison at all, given that it doesn't really lend itself to a Lego set that well. Moving onwards, let's now take a look. I'm going to push all these guys to the side to clear up some space. We have one of the more recent sets from 2022. This is a very odd set because the entire premise behind the set was to be able to use different modules. So all these different modules connect to each other via a pin system. And they also connect to one of the larger sets, the uh, Monastery Dojo in the back there. But this was all built around using Zane's spinner to be able to go along the set like it was supposed to spin and then slide down the slide. And you're supposed to kind of battle the weaponry with it and knock over things. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. Like, it, it literally is impossible to make it work. As soon as you launch the spinner, it doesn't stay in this particular point. It, like, bounces off or just flies in a different direction. And it doesn't ever go down the slide if you make it. So this was kind of a very weird set. It seems like it maybe needed a few more tests in the iteration kind of testing to be able to make it actually work. But you know what? It's just an okay add-on, and I do like how this was a cool connecting piece to the main Dojo Temple of the same year in 2022. Setting that aside, though, let's take a look at our next build. This was also one of the arena sets. This was the Airjitsu Battleground. So this came with the Lloyd and Nia Airjitsu spinners, which were the only two we were missing from the Possession Wave. And let's see if I can actually demonstrate how this works. So let me just get some of this other stuff out of the way and we're going to try to launch one of these i mean we have a fairly open space here let's get my hand here yeah so well what's supposed to happen is you pull this bar here which is a lego technic rack and pinion gear and it's supposed to basically just spin on the ground like this so it's supposed to launch these spinners like that i mean we can try it one more time it was a pretty interesting feature i think it's just hitting my hands this is in the way i'm going to move that for now let's see if we can get this to yeah, there we go. Okay, so that was how that works. Oh, a little dangerous how it's knocking stuff over. But that was the general intent behind the set. And it was really satisfying being able to use these. This was in 2016 for the Day of the Departed Wave, although I guess it kind of is more like a possession set because it mixes a few different things. I mean, obviously the Temple of Virjitsu was a possession type of thing, but again, entire premise was just to be able to play around with this. And there were a few places you could play around with minifigures all around the temple itself. If you stood a minifigure up here, you could push them off all of a sudden by pressing in that button there. These stairs actually collapse, so if you pull a button on the back there, these stairs all kind of fall over and slide downwards and can be reset just by pushing a button back up, just like that. And this whole thing right here does open up, so you can cause this to flip outwards and knock a minifigure out. Again, very, very basic play features, just a super, super simple opening door, but it's kind of reminiscent of the original dojo from the 2011 wave, using these same exact doors there, so it's cool to see those pieces being still in circulation at this point. And they did include the actual handles, so if you wanted to, you could actually use this to launch the air jitsu spinners themselves. So it did come with the actual pinions to actually cause them to fly up. So I like how they included the handles if you wanted to use them like that. So you could have them on the ground or in the air. And they actually work pretty well as temple columns. I mean, surprisingly well, I will say. But we can set this particular build aside and move on. All of these are modular, so they're super easy to just pop off and detach there so let's just get this separated out and out of the way here now we can take a look at the next build which is just this little one right here which is the dojo or the kind of blacksmith shop from the 2017 hands of time wave in january 
This was the blacksmith's shop in the swamp that Crux and the Chronics held Ray and Maya in over the duration of most of the Ninjago series to work on the vermilion armor for them. You can see it opens up like so, so you can see the full interior. This is actually a really nicely detailed blacksmith area. You've got hammers that work on the weapons there. You have all sorts of different weapons being mounted on the wall here. And most importantly, it did come with the Fusion Dragon Blade. I don't have it right now because it is actually being used in the hands of the minifigures, but we can just use this other blade, which will do just the trick like so. And the way it worked was that you plug the Fusion Blade into here and you just plug it right into that slot and it allows you to spin this area right here if you actually can get it not to be stuck to showcase all the different stickers. So it does tend to stick a lot. I mean, it's not the most perfect play feature because I can imagine like it's kind of annoying to get to move, but once you have it moving, this is not the best spinning point. It does showcase all these different parts. It does tend to catch a little bit because as you can see, you've got the flames on the inside, which kind of rotate up and down as you spin it. So you do have that, but then the flames just cause it to catch a lot of times. I mean, you can see it's just really having a hard time rotating there. I mean, it's not, not really working all too well, but the way it was supposed to work was that you stick this here and then you can rotate it around and kind of see the different symbols switch and yeah, not the best working play feature, but I like how they did attempt to have that kind of fusion dragon like blade being used for the set. Now, this closes up and I actually, for being a small side build to what was the main build of the fusion dragon, I love the aesthetic of this. I mean, this is really charming. You've got the large circular windows. It really does have that classic Ninjago feel. Is the fusion dragon blade there? Oh, there it is. Oh, that's funny. I thought I had it on my figure. There it is. Okay. Well, you take it and you move it like that. But again, it doesn't work that well. I mean, like, yeah, it just kind of gets stuck. But, you know, you take the fusion blade and that's how that works. I like the aesthetics of this. Having the combination of fire and water here and the motif continuing throughout the entire set was very cool. And this is actually a mount for the dragon itself. The, the chimney is a hole and the dragon itself had a little bit of a square that you could slot into the set itself. So it was really cool to be able to mount that on the top of the set. Moving on from this though, I'm going to take this and give it to the minifigures later on. We can now move on to the 2022 Dojo Temple here. This was the main temple for the core wave of 2022. And it was in January. I actually really like this build. I mean, the green roof is reminiscent of, of course, that back temple over there from Rebooted, which we'll take a look at in a second. But I like how it kind of is a little bit different from other Ninjago temples. It sets itself apart by having a different color scheme of the green roofs and the black outlines, and kind of this white wooden area. The roller coaster piece being used to the bridge is really smart. I do like that. And you have a nice brick built studs on the side staircase leading all the way up to the dojo itself. So overall, very nice looking. This does actually have an interior as well. One that is a little bit more detailed than a lot of the ones we're used to. You have a tea place for Master Wu. You have a section that folds out and acts kind of like the hidden samurai cave underneath the main monastery in the TV show. So I like how you have different looks at the mechs and weapons there for Pixel. So a little station for her there. You have some weapons racks on the wall. You move upwards and there's some boxes, a Ninjago trading card, some swords there and some tea spilling over a magazine. So overall, just a nice looking build to have with a full playable interior. One of the most interesting style of builds that we've gotten in a long time. Very complimentary to this with also a dark green roof is the Temple of Fortitude, which came out in the summer wave for Rebooted in 2014. And this was, again, a fairly basic temple, but you're starting to see where Ninjago was starting to evolve its visual style here. This is obviously a little bit more interesting than some of the other ones we saw in the past from like 2011 to 2013. It had a very rudimentary disc launcher, just like that. This was before, literally a year before they made the disc launcher piece. So they had to accomplish it with a big tire and everything, a very weird way of doing it, but I guess that works. And overall, you can see that this does have an interior. One of the things here is that you actually have spikes, which are very, very hard to see, but it's easier to tell if you have a figure mounted here, for instance, you can press this button and, well, what's supposed to happen is the spikes move upwards and if they're kind of on it loosely, these spikes do knock them off like that. So just supposed to be a, a little safeguard there to prevent enemies from popping up. A very, very hard to notice function, but it's just a cool thing that they have there to be included. Now, 
You've got some catapults on the side here. You press a button and the catapults fire, so that's a cool thing to have. And going on to the back here, there's that wheel that lets you shoot the discs. You have a Technic Competition Cannon that actually is mounted just on the back there. And the interior is just pretty basic. There's some nods to the technological aspect of Rebooted with this right here. But for the most part, it was a very basic Ninjago temple. And again, you can really see how much Ninjago has changed in terms of giving us full interiors when you compare this to the interior that we just took a look at in the 2022 Monastery, which had a very similar color scheme and build, but was very, very much more detailed on the back. With that, we can move on to the very first Ninjago temple ever. This was the Temple of Fire. This was the big one, the main one. And this was obviously a two-pack featuring both the temple as well as the fire dragon, whose head just stuck right through here. And there's an entire platform on the back for the fire dragon to just stand on top of, so you can mount it here, have the head poking through here, the entire feature of the temple. Now, my rubber bands are pretty old, so I'm going to have to do this manually, but you pull this up. It unlocks and it was supposed to slide open, but because the rubber bands are permanently stretched and it's very old and a little bit dusty, so doesn't work quite as intended, but I mean, this is supposed to be how it works out. Opens up like this, and that was the entire design of the Fire Temple was that it splits in half and reveals the dragon, which was something we saw in the mini movies. Now to close it up, super simple you just push the two halves closed and it does look pretty good closed up as well this is a pretty nice temple it also had a bridge going off to the side which we've got somewhere over there but this was the main build for it and again super basic interior some training area here a little bit of i guess sushi and some weapons mounted but for the most part it's just a lot of empty space it's good you can mount figures there but not a lot that you can actually do inside the temple however for being one of the first ones in the summer of 2011, the aesthetic design of this is actually really good. I like how this actually has the kind of pagoda style roof. It's definitely one that really set the stage for what future Ninjago temples would look like. And for that, that definitely deserves a special place for all of the Ninjago buildings. Going from there though, the next large scale Ninjago temple that we actually got was a Temple of Air Jitsu in 2015. Now, I have modified my copy to have a much more kind of larger brick-built rock face. This was one of the early mocks that I was playing around with right when the set came out. But initially, it had this kind of design where you could have these different buildings that attached to it. So all of these came as part of the Temple of Air Jitsu, and you also had a bridge that was able to connect them and some other pieces that were able to go around it. But I was trying to kind of modify this to make it closer to the show and separate these out. This feels more of a Lego castle building than a Lego Ninjago building. I find it very interesting how they used this style of architecture for a Ninjago building. It looks really good. I mean, I really like how it looks. It just kind of feels more of a Lego castle thing. This, on the other hand, does feel like a Ninjago building and was the first time they used this very specialized building technique of the garage door pieces curved around to act as roofs. That was super interesting and really cool how they were able to factor that in. I really do like that. But overall, the focus is on the temple. You have the statue of Sensei Yang there, the creator of Air Jitsu, and it's a really nice temple. I mean, this looks really good from the front. Very, very happy with how this turned out. This is one of my favorite Ninjago temples ever. It just looks so good having that being featured there with just in all its glory, especially for summer of 2015. This was something really special. And of course, it does have a full interior as well. One of my favorite features, uh, features was the puppet show here. Unfortunately, the light brick has died. The battery has died a long time ago, but the way it worked was that you could push this here and then lights would shine through this particular place here and allow you to see an actual light up tail of the two brothers and the great devourer. So cool how they had that. Unfortunately, the light brick is long dead because this tends to just always be pushed in. So the light brick was always on. However, on the inside of the temple, you actually have a full kind of area, just a blank area to train. Moving upwards, there is more of a training area up here, so a dojo type space. And then here you have a little space for reading and for books and whatnot, for presumably for Sensei Wu to be able to just stay here and be able to read his books, do some paintings, and even a box for Cole stuff, which I guess makes sense given how similar he is or how closely tied he is to Master Yang, the guardian of the temple itself. 
overall, this was Ninjago's first direct-to-consumer set. It is very, very iconic for that reason because this really set the stage of what you would expect for Ninjago buildings in the future. This was elevated well beyond what Ninjago had done in the past. And for 2015, this just paved the way for the future for more amazing Ninjago buildings we would eventually see. And don't worry, we're saving the best for last. So let's set this aside now and just take a look at some of the last buildings here. This is just a collection of other smaller Ninjago buildings. You have some market stalls from the Ninjago City 2017 sets. You have a 2019 Ninjago Legacy training area. Lots of four plus little builds like this one's from 2020. You have the Ninja Brick Box stuff right here. So this is from the 2023 January Ninja Brick Box. You have a very similar build from the Lego Ninjago movie for a... Whoa, that's really similar, huh? Interesting. Yeah, this is from 2017. This is from 2019. They were both little like $10 or $8 sets where you could have a ninja training against an enemy. All of these dark green roof buildings are from the 2023 Ninja Brick Box. This was the original Ninjago Blacksmith Shop. I am shocked we did not get one for Legacy. This is asking for a Legacy remake because... Oh, this is, this is not a great set. This is very rudimentary, but you know, it is what it is. Just opens up. It has that transformation feature, which I do like having that factored in. This was, again, the main building for the Ninjago uh, ride from the Legoland ride. So you can flop it onto the back there and see Samakai featured on the back of the set back in 2020, as well as the rest of the Skulk in there. But yeah, that's the Ninjago ride. This was the Christmas tree of the employee-exclusive Ninjago Temple of Celebrations, which we'll take a look at in a second. We have some more Ninjago Ride stuff. Let's see. More 4 Plus stuff here. We've got, let's see, what else do we have? Oh, this was cool. For Possession, we got a little bit of a build for Cloud Kingdom. This is the only physical build for Cloud Kingdom we've ever gotten, which is very interesting and very different from the typical Ninjago color scheme of the gold and white. Although it was marketed, I think, as like Steep Wisdom or something like that. Or maybe this was Steep Wisdom right here with Wu's Dragon. Here we have a bit of a lava bridge that collapses from tournament developments. Very basic, but I think it's pretty cool. You've got the, the treads being used there as a bridge, and that just falls over for the tournament developments wave. Some more dojo stuff from the epic battle sets of 2021. Another 4 plus type build for the... I, man, this was, this was from 2020, I think. And yeah, all of these are just super basic, super rudimentary little builds that are just okay. I mean, all of these I count as just random side builds that aren't the most interesting. Although I do like the Ninjago City stalls. I may try to factor this in as a food market in my street and my cities themselves. Lastly, we have just a couple more play sets here before we get to the big ones. Let's just try to push all these to the side. This right here is the Samurai X Cave. This is easily one of my favorite Ninjago playsets and what I consider to be one of the best they have ever done. This came out in 2016 for the Day of the Departed Wave and was basically the only physical representation we have ever gotten for the Samurai X Cave, which first appeared in Rebooted. They reused the Bionicle 2015 blade element to have the jaw of the skeleton open up, which was a very cool parts usage there. So that closes up there and then opens up to form the ramp leading straight into the area itself. You just have these slope pieces being used as the ramp to drive your vehicles in. You have a bit of a security feature here. So if you want, you can have the security bars be blocking off the main door or be blocking off a prisoner on that side, depending on how you want to use it. So very cool how they factor that in. I like how it almost feels like a bat cave because you've got the different screens that are mounted here featuring all different characters from across the world of Ninjago. And one of my favorite things was this because you can see here, you have different components of a jet, and you could actually do this with a mech as well, which I have somewhere else over there, but you've got a jet, so you could say, okay, you want to use the engine here, you want to use the wings, and you want to use this front of the jet, so you just kind of place them, place them here. So you first place them just horizontally on the platform, so all of these are loose, you just put them together, and then you hit this button, and... It all builds it. Like, this is a feature to literally put together a ship, and then now they're all connected, and this can blast off. The same can be used with other pieces. Like, if you wanted to use this flying piece here, you just kind of put that there. This can be added onto it here, and then you can just put the engine on the back here where it belongs. You press this button. There you have it. This is ready to go. 
Wow, this is just such a cool feature. I, I wish that more LEGO sets did stuff like this because I just love the way that this works so well together that everything just can be literally built on a bench here. You line the parts up, squeeze it together, and the jet is ready to launch. That is just so, so cool. I love that feature. And they also have a great feature that is really reminiscent to classic LEGO space themes where you can spin this and have one part of the platform actually rotate to allow you to move on a bridge to the next area here. This is literally a transformation feature down to the rack and pinion system that they used in the classic space Futuron monorail. And they literally just took a very, very similar build. Obviously the original rack and pinion bricks don't exist anymore, so they just reused it for this set here. But you have this entire piece slide outwards, just so satisfying to see that slide. And then of course, when this is built, you can kind of imagine that's where the jet exhaust goes. So you want to move out of the way and have this launch off and fly off out of the cave. Just so cool. Oh my goodness. I love the set so much. And you even have blueprints for some of the different things that you can find inside the set itself. Everything about this is so, so good. In the summer of 2016, this was probably one of my favorite Ninjago play sets ever. Just really satisfying how everything goes together. There's even an elevator. Like this is an elevator that has a hydraulic piece attached to it because a mech was standing here. I have it mounted with the rest of my mechs back there, but you would have an elevator to board your mechs and yeah, just so good. I love the set so much and it is definitely one of the best Ninjago play sets ever. Moving onwards, we only have a couple more to go before we can move into Ninjago City. This right here is the Temple of Celebrations. This was the 2021 LEGO exclusive employee gift. If you don't know, every Christmas, LEGO gives out free gifts to all of their employees who've been there, I think, for at least a year to kind of celebrate being at the LEGO group. And this was a Ninjago themed one. So it came with all of the gold Ninjago legacy minifigures. And while it is a little bit more fragile than you would expect for a standard Lego set, it features a snow covered temple that actually does look really good and is kind of reminiscent to the original design of the Temple of Erjitsu. It has a really nice interior as well, where you could either put the Christmas tree or you could put all of the ninja characters sitting around the table eating some pudding together, which was very nice. 10 years of Ninjago, of course, featured back there and you can swap it out and instead you can put the Christmas tree there as well. So you could choose to place this just right down there. And then instead of the trees, it had a lot of gifts where you could put under the tree, but I think having the table there is probably the best configuration for the set itself. Up here, there's some nice little details of desks, a micro scale version of Ninjago City Gardens. That is Ninjago City Gardens right there. Very cool how they factor that in. And lastly, a bit of a piece to place Golden Wu's head and beard on the actual golden figure itself, which in this set used just his regular face. Overall, just a cool thing to get Ninjago as an employee gift. And one th I think my favorite thing about the set was that the LEGO designer specifically did not include any recolors or exclusive minifigures in the set itself to allow it to be rebuilt by as many fans as possible. Most Christmas employee gifts include exclusive minifigures or exclusive prints or exclusive stickers. And this has none of that. Anyone who wants to make this, who doesn't want to have to pay top dollar for a copy from other folks can just buy the bricks themselves and make it, which I really do appreciate because the designers knew there were a lot of fans of Ninjago who would want to recreate this. And finally, we just have one last set here. For the second wave of Skybound, we finally got the Lighthouse from, which originally appeared back in the Final Battle 2013 season, appeared again in the 2016 Skybound season. We finally got it as a Lego set and it does not disappoint. This was featuring Jay and Nia's last stand against the Sky Pirates as they invaded to capture Nia. This whole thing, you can remove the torch here to unlock it, to open it up, where you can see the entire structure opens up, but because this thing is attached, it doesn't open up that much. And you can mostly really see a lot of it anyways back here, so I usually just leave it closed. Now, the way that this whole thing works is that you have this whole table here, which initially set up with just cups and a table and a plate there, but then it opens up and reveals a weapons rack with the hidden Tiger Widow Venom inside, which was a very important plot point from the 2016 season. This whole piece opens up to dump dynamite on enemies, so you can kind of load up dynamite on this particular point here. Just put it on the tray there, and then on the front, as enemies are making their way up, you just dump it and it falls right out of the side there. So cool to see that being included as a feature. 
Now, you also have the collapsing stairs feature, so you can pull this out, and the stairs just collapse to allow the villains to fall into the dungeons below, which is a cool touch, and everything about this is very playable and specifically built to repel invaders, which I thought was a very interesting design for a LEGO build. Up top here, you have, or down at the bottom here, you have the workshop for Echo Zane and the T-Robot. You have some blueprints as well. You have a missile, a black missile, which is very rare to see this colored in black, that just loads right here and fires directly at any enemies that come in through the front door. And of course, while it doesn't make sense in the scene, it was a must-have to include the Teapot of Tyron, which was the most important feature of this set. And then it does even have a light break, so you press on the top, and you have the lighthouse actually light up, which was a very, very nice touch. They definitely didn't need to include it, but for being a lighthouse for Ninjago, this does look really good. And it is very reminiscent of how it appeared in the TV show. One of the rare instances of something being designed for the show itself and then being brought into the actual mainline set line. But now it's time. We have saved the best for last. It's time to take a look at hands down, no question, the three best Ninjago buildings ever. Starting off with Ninjago City Docks. This came out in the summer of 2018 and was an add-on to the mainline Ninjago City set. This was something that was modular so you can connect all of the Ninjago City sets in a modular fashion and have them all in a city street. And this is really good because obviously this was packed full of Easter eggs. There are so many Easter eggs, almost too many to count in a set like this, but We'll try to cover just some of the most important ones. This was only the only time we got a physical mask of creation from Bionicle was in the form of a sticker here, which is very funny. Each of these open up and are their own buildings. So you have Grand Sensei Derrett's Mojo Dojo featuring the original sign from the TV show right there. So love how they factor that in. This is an entire dojo area. So that's pretty cool. Seems like Derrett has stepped up his training regimen. And here you've got an arcade area with a lot of references to other Ninjago TV show Easter eggs like Starfare there. There's that Bionicle Mask of Creation, so very cool to see that being factored in. So I do really like that overall to be able to see that here. So cool to see a ton of Easter eggs here on the arcade. There's an Easter egg for Shadow of Ronin on the side of that arcade, which was Ninjago's first kind of specialized original game made for it. And one thing that's very cool is a working uh, vending machine. So you take a dollar bill, you stick it in here, and it dispenses. And it does not dispense unless you have a dollar bill. See, it's ready to dispense, and then you put it in. And another drink dispenses. That is so cool. I mean, I was shocked to see that actually working as an actual build. It was, I think, the first working vending machine we've ever seen in a Lego set. Super easy to reset, too. You just kind of put them... Or let me put the dollar bill in first here so we can have that set aside. But you just put the cans in there and it's ready to go. Very, very cool how they have that as an actual feature. Now, of course, there's a ton of references to older LEGO themes. There's a LEGO universe reference here. Opening up here, we have all sorts of other rooms and houses. So you've got this whole house here featuring a Joker hairpiece as the bush there. One of the best things about these Ninjago City sets is that every single building tells a story. From a little family home here with dorm rooms and a kitchen to what appears to be some sort of a docks or fisherman's workshop over in there. Every single building has some sort of a purpose to it. And I think one of my favorite things about the Ninjago City dock set is that it can be featured as working looking good from both sides this looks just as good as this and it's really cool how this is kind of a two-sided set now of course there are a lot of different features that you can find here lots of just little itty bitty types of details that i really do appreciate like a little bit of a dock for the boat here going out of the cave of course on these sets you have the water which is done really well to showcase different layers of water and different depth levels which is very cool and overall just some of the best Ninjago sets ever. And for this to be, I mean, it's the worst out of the three by default because it's like the smallest and maybe the least interesting. It's still really, really good. And now it's time to take a look at the one that started it all back in 2017, back in the beginning when Ninjago was first selling. This was actually from 2018. This was from 2018 summer for the Ninjago movie Second Wave. This was from 2017 summer for the first wave of Ninjago movie sets. I've added some custom lights to it. And this is the original Ninjago City, complete with a working sushi bar up top here, which is a very, very nice moving conveyor belt for sushi right there, and a fully detailed built up interior. Every single room here is a unique room. 
This was just, it set the golden standard for what you would expect for a Lego Ninjago modular building style build. And wow, this, this is still probably one of my, if not my favorite Lego set ever. I think this is probably the best of what Lego can do. And it's just so cool. I could, I could talk for a while about this, but you've got a clothing spore, the crab restaurant here. You have a Galador poster, which I really like. You have all sorts of different Easter eggs to different little things and other Lego themes just going all the way around here, like Lego Extreme Team. And even the bottom layer, there's a little tea shop here. That's a really nice tea shop to be featured just right in there. You've got bridge going over water that the boat can sail through. That's a classic, oh, that's a classic print for the arrow moving there. That is a good print to get from the original Lego space stuff. And then we can rotate it all the way back. Again, this is a custom light kit. I've done a full video on how I lit this all up, but you have an elevator, which does service every single floor. So you can kind of bring it up to there. And if this is stuck on correctly, you bring it up here as well. So you can kind of enter the clothing store through there, or you can bring it up to the top and just go all the way to the very top to enter the main sushi area. So it's cool how you actually have attention to detail paid to having access to all the levels, even if the elevator is pretty basic. One thing here is a working ATM as well, which actually has a lot of engineering that goes into it to rapidly spit out and feed different dollar bills. You kind of like pull a lever back and then you push this forward. So a working kind of all sorts of different unique things going into this building and yeah, for 2017, this just blew me away totally and completely. This is one of the largest Ninjago sets ever. At the time it released, it was the largest. And now has only been upstaged by one more, which I consider to be the greatest LEGO set ever. This is, well, the back of Ninjago City Gardens, and it, it looks real good from the back. And you can rotate it all the way around to the front to take a look at this absolutely majestic Lego set. This is just so good. I mean, if Ninjago City was good, this is on another level because this was for Ninjago Legacy. So the builders actually got a chance to try to integrate this into more of a Ninjago TV show style of theme rather than for the Ninjago movie. And it really shows because the Easter eggs really do make it feel like it is part of the Lego Ninjago television show. From the Museum of History being factored in here as an official build featuring the Griefbringer dragon up there, the skeleton dragon, and a fully detailed interior of the museum showcasing all of the different parts of the history of Ninjago. Ninjago. You're celebrating the 10 years of Ninjago here with that printed tile. Of course, so many Easter eggs that are really fun to take a look at. And at the hands of time, Prime Empire, you've got like the, the Timmy toy thing from Time Cruisers, just looking so good. And overall, I really like how this has a unique design to it with a massive tree growing through the center. That is a really unique aesthetic for the Ninjago City Gardens type thing. You have an arcade set up for the Prime Empire Arcade, which actually does feature working motion. Like you can control the character in that arcade there. Like look, look at this. You can kind of see it on camera. It was, it was visible right here. Zoom in there. You can actually make him jump. That is a working arcade machine. All the little Easter eggs and details here are just so good. And I am a huge fan of how this entire building ended up. I just wish LEGO would do more of these and not just limit them to really special things. Like, obviously they did a couple for the LEGO Ninjago movie. They did one for Ninjago 10 Years Legacy. I feel the market would support making more of these. I mean, these are some of the most popular LEGO sets out there. And I feel like LEGO could put out like one of these every two years, maybe that would work. I mean, they, they haven't done it so far because this came out in 2021, but I would love to see even more expansions to the Ninjago City modular lineup because they're just so good. They are compatible with other LEGO modular buildings and they just work so, so well. There you can see a few of the other Ninjago spinner-like buildings. You've got a serpentine building there with an exclusive print on the curved piece there, as well as a special spinner gimmick where you could actually push buttons to strike spinners as they spun around. And uh, yeah, you can see why I chose not to remove them from the shelf, but uh, you can see it all the way back there. That's one of the other... I wouldn't even count it as a building. I mean, if we count that as a building, we count the Technic frame for spinners as a building as well. So these are more like spinner gimmicks, but I guess they do kind of work as buildings. So that's why I'm mentioning them here right now, just at the end of this video. Otherwise, we pretty much showed everything else. And with that, we have finally, let's see, nothing else. We finally summed up. It is like 2.30 to 3 in the morning for me, but we have summed up every single Lego Ninjago building 
ever made, this was such a cool journey to go on to be able to take a look at the evolution of buildings. I think they really started getting very good around the 2015 era with the Temple of Erjitsu. That was a game changer. That really redefined what you would expect from the LEGO Ninjago original lineup. And from 2015 onwards, it was full steam ahead. They had some of my favorites, some really great buildings here. And of course, culminating in 2017's Ninjago City, 2018's Ninjago City Docks, and 2021's Ninjago City Gardens. So good, just so fun to be able to put these all together. Some of the best buildings yet, and I can't wait to see what LEGO Ninjago buildings have in store. So this video is being recorded in January of 2023, which means that the buildings for the brand new show, the 2023 Ninjago United show, have not been revealed yet. But I certainly cannot wait to see how those could stack up to the many, many great buildings we have here. Allegedly, we are getting a villain building that's pretty big. I think it's definitely larger than a lot of the recent ones we've gotten in a while, so I'm very excited for that. But overall, we've summed up our look at all of the Ninjago buildings. Let me know down in the comments below which one is your favorite, what villain building is your favorite, what hero building is your favorite, and which ones do you own? Maybe even... I know a lot of people are going to say their favorites are Ninjago City, Gardens, or Docks. So let's say excluding these, what are your favorites? Maybe even excluding the Temple of Rajitsu, because I'd be really curious to hear that from everyone around. All right, and with the Ninjago City modular set aside to put in my eventual large-scale LEGO City, we have summed up this entire video showcasing every single one of the LEGO Ninjago buildings, temples, palaces, you name it, ever made from LEGO from 2011 to 2023. This has been a really fun journey of kind of just walking through the villain buildings, which personally, I just find a little bit more interesting because I do love my Ninjago style temples and palaces. Always, always good to get those. But I also love it when Ninjago does completely unique things and tries something new and different. And that's what I really love about the villain buildings of Ninjago, where not two buildings feel like they are from the same faction. Everything feels unique and different from an ice castle to a video game temple to all sorts of different things like a floating crystal palace. Ninjago's villain buildings are really cool, but of course, some of the best buildings are either related to the city or to the, nin or to the ninja faction themselves. Altogether, this has been a really fun video. I hope you enjoyed this look at every single LEGO Ninjago building ever made from 2011 to 2023. And be sure to stay tuned to Duck Breaks for even more LEGO news, reviews, discussion, and analyses coming your way very soon. Thank you so much. You can check out the links in the description below for my LEGO Brickling store and my 3D printed Bionicle Big Cartel store, as well as other means to support the channel if you so wish. Thank you all so much for tuning in, and bye for now.